Hello, I'm Bill Lee of Oxford Film Productions. Now energy is of prime importance to all of us, whether it be in the form of light, heat or motive power. I was talking to Nicholas Newman. He is an energy expert based in Oxford and writes regularly for technical publications and acts as a consultant on anything to do with energy. Morning Nicholas. Morning Bill. Let us start with a recent ominous development. What do you think are the strategic implications of Russia's recent annexation of Crimea for European energy? Well, the media likes to portray it as the worst thing that's happened to Europe since the Second World War. I disagree. Although, in immediate terms, Europe has something to worry about with 30% of gas supplies coming from Russia and in Germany and in Eastern Europe it is much higher. In reality, it is Russia that has got to worry about Europe's reactions to the situation because 60% of Russia's federal budget is derived from export revenues of oil and gas to Europe. So, for instance, I propose a way of punishing Russia and helping with long-term energy independence for Europe is if Europe cut its gas imports from Russia by 10%. And this can be easily achieved by increasing um, imports from Norway and from North Africa and Central Asia through existing pipelines. There is the spare capacity available. In addition, Europe can do other methods to reduce energy consumption. For a start, at the moment, Europe has insufficient energy storage to absorb the surplus power generated from renewable power generation. It needs to uh, quadruple its energy storage capacity. It can do this in several ways. One is to ensure that every member state has at least one month supply of gas. Secondly, it can encourage investment in electricity storage through such the technologies as lithium ion batteries and pump storage schemes, for instance. Also, Europe can do things to improve the ability of the European power networks, gas networks, oil networks to switch energy across the country, to across Europe, to where it is needed. And this is vital. And this means that Europe has got to speed up such measures as the further integration of the um, European single energy market, for instance. And of course, most importantly, it needs to think about, actually not think about, it needs to get on with, seriously with investment in energy efficiency and insulation of um, buildings throughout the continent. And that means such practical measures as improvements in building standards. More importantly, Europe needs to get serious about shale. It must overcome its NIMBY um, troglodyte views against shale gas exploration because it is a good way of Europe not only reducing its dependency on energy imports but also, uh, also becoming independent. So this means Britain, Germany and France have to start having serious shale gas exploration programs. In addition, they've got to look at the North Sea for potential uh, shale gas uh, exploitation um, under the sea, which we'll see. 
And lastly, they've got to get America to start delivering gas to Europe, um, which is very important for our energy security, so further reducing our need for Russian gas. And this will hurt the Russian economy, given its perilous state, when it needs to earn $115 a barrel for oil, and currently it, uh, the price of oil is at um, just under 100 So it is, things are not looking good for the Russian state. And um, President Putin should stop these silly grand political gestures and get on seriously with um, reforming the, the Russian economy so it is properly competitive and no longer just uh, dependent on energy exports for its economic prosperity. Turning to the global oil industry, one can't ignore the frequency of reports covering oil explorations. Can you tell me a little more about this? Well, it's incredible the number of huge discoveries in the last 10 years the oil and gas industry has made not only by large um, multinational companies like BP, Total, Eni, but also by large independent companies like Endarco and GL Noble. They have done this, they've achieved this by, as a result of significant advances in technology in such areas as 3D seismic uh, surveying, uh, geological information management systems and um, uh, in the evolution of submersible robots. Th robots are necessary not only for surveying in the deep seas of the world um, but they are also there for installing equipment for pumping out the oil and also maintenance purposes. So where have they found oil and gas? Well there's been spectacular discoveries for instance in such places as um, Gerald Noble's discovery uh, in the eastern Mediterranean between Cyprus and Israel which is going to turn those two countries into net gas exporters which should be beneficial for both countries, especially Cyprus, um, which has suffered badly under the economic downturn. Other areas they found uh, have been off the island of Newfoundland and off Rio de Janeiro. And elsewhere, like Australia, the big uh, fields of, of um, Western Australia are quite spectacular. But the most interesting find in recent times has been E9's nice discovery with Enarch Darko um, in Mozambique. Here they found one of the biggest gas fields in 20 years, which should make this poverty stricken country into an energy superpower in a decade's time. As for the future, well, well South Africa looks like a good bet. There will be um, likely to be a spectacular number of fines both onshore and offshore. There are already, uh, according to recent surveys, um, the Karoo Desert is a good place for sh uh, shale gas exploration uh, and exploitation and that should help cut South Africa's um, oil import bill and also reduce its need to use coal power stations to generate um, electricity because the gas from the Karoo Desert will be um, as cheap or even cheaper than coal power generation um, which will be beneficial for South Africa's um, economy. Both gas supplies and consumption have increased in the last decade and there has been a commensurate rise in investment in new gas pipelines. Could you elaborate? Basically there has been a boom in construction in new 
pipelines throughout the world. The most spectacular ex um, example is North America, and this is as a result of the many amazing new oil and gas uh, discoveries as a result of unconventional drilling. And, and as, as a result, uh, many of these new fields are in areas which were not traditionally associated with oil and gas production. Um, so this has meant that a whole, there has had to be construction of many new um, small pipelines to connect up with the regional and national grids of Canada and uh, the United States and Mexico. In addition, there have had to be brand new pipelines to overcome capacity problems such as deliveries of gas from the Marcellus gas fields in Appalachia to New York and the American Northeast. This has meant the construction of a new direct pipeline which has had the beneficial result of reducing costs of uh, gas to consumer and also increased supplies of gas to consumers there, which has been very useful in the hard winter that the United States faced um, last winter uh, in keeping a lot of homes warm for American citizens. Elsewhere in Europe, for instance, there has been um, in uh, uh, investment in a, in upgrading the north south pipelines uh, and vice versa and this is still going on but it need more investment is necessary in order for for instance the pipeline plan to connect the norwegian gas fields with eastern and central europe only part of it is complete but once complete, it will mean that the countries of Eastern and Central Europe will be much less dependent on uh, Russian gas. And also, there is the other question in Europe, which is probably unique. It's how there is a surplus of capacity of Russian-built pipelines for linking Russian um, gas fields with markets in the West. Most of them are turning into white elephants and it is unlikely they'll ever break even. Um, and the, Amer the Russians are insisting on building another white elephant called Sudstream, which is just going to add to Gazprom's um, budgetary problems. But if they wish to do that, that's their affair but it's not really in Europe's uh, strategic interest. Elsewhere, there are building pipelines everywhere, like in China, linking the new shale field, gas shale fields with um, their major cities. But actually, they're having to rebuild from scratch and replace the existing pipeline network, which is in very poor condition, so that it can meet the de um, demands of the 21st century. Elsewhere, there are new pipelines and undersea pipelines in Australia and Argentina um, linking up with new fields. But basically, to, uh, to be an engineer in the pipeline sector is good news. You've got plenty of good job opportunities. In addition, uh, there are improvements going on in the various interconnectors that connect Europe with North Africa and um, there have been recent new pipeline interconnectors like the one that connects Italy with um, Greece and Turkey which enables Central Asia to uh, export its gas to Central Europe and Italy and further reduce uh, Europe's dependency on Russian gas. Thank you, Nicholas. You must come again and keep us up to date on energy developments.